wanted to begin this evening with something I wrote. It was quite spontaneous. Just, um, just before that IBME, Inward Bound Mindfulness Education Retreat, um, that I did recently, because I think it relates to the theme of this evening. I titled it Manifesto of Our Times. The world can seem broken, and on the relative plane, there's great truth to that. The world is broken. We don't have to look far for proof. And it's important, as we address that which is broken, to remember what's unbreakable, to keep our eye on it, to turn our heart's attention to the truth beneath our suffering, our inner connection, our oneness, our love. If we want things to be different, we must act on behalf of the recognition of our shared being. We must selflessly serve the greatest truth collectively. Liberation is not a singular experience. In the greatest truth, there's no such thing as singular. Our true nature cannot be possessed by a separate self. It possesses us. Love is our foundation. And in the name of freedom for all, we must remember that. So I wanted to start this evening with a little bit about what, what that means that we don't possess our true nature, that, that true nature possesses us. And I pointed to that just a bit in the meditation. Um, how many folks in the room uh, felt as though the, the approach of that meditation might have been a little bit different than your customary practice? Yeah. Anyone willing to point to what felt unique about it, at least in terms of how you might normally approach your regular practice? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah, you're recognizing, you're naming a process that you do that, I mean, how many people is it familiar to strive to not strive, right? If you're sitting in this room, you kind of know the right answer is let go of striving. And yet we can find ourselves striving to not strive. It's the same thing I've noticed with the process of judgment, like I'm, I'm judging myself for judging now because I'm a spiritual person, I'm not supposed to be judging, so now I'm judging myself for judging. So, yeah, catching that process of, of efforting to not effort or striving to not strive is really helpful. Um, and it's, at the beginning of the meditation, I pointed to this being just one place I'm really interested in right now. Um, and I think in particular, because as someone who had enough um, of a draw to pursue practice to actually move into a monastery and take a vow of silence and celibacy and everything you do as you move into a monastery, shaving my head and living as a monk, um, there was a, a striver within me that was alive and well. And in some ways, uh, I can look back on that period of time and be quite grateful that there was such drive to find out what's possible through practice, through sincere, committed, non-distracted practice. And it's been very important for me um, since that time to see what that keeps in place, what that process of striving and efforting keeps in place. 
So thanks for just naming that for you. It felt like you could rest more easily when given perhaps a different kind of permission to not effort. Yeah. And rest in a different way. Mm -hmm. Can you say more about what, 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 what made it resting in a different way? No, no problem. Yeah, what you're saying, just in case not everyone can hear you, is that, you know, you've heard or even offered instructions before where the attention's being placed so lightly on the breath. It's even the image of like a feather or just such a light touch. Um, how many other people relate to just that being a, an approach, um, that kind of light touch? It's, it's really helpful because it does dismantle the striving process a bit, doesn't it? But in my experience, it, it sort of softens the striving process, but it doesn't ask us to question what's underneath the striving process. Do you, does that resonate with you? Okay. But what occurred to me as you were talking was that when I'm placing attention at others, when I am doing this, mm -hmm. it is like a me and a them. It's a, and, and what happened in this meditation was that it was, a, it was, a, it was more of a oneness. Yes, yeah, so. Yes, in, in your experience, the, even the resting lightly with the attention, it creates a, a bit of a division and, and a me and them. And that actually is what I wanted to talk about tonight. So thank you. I promise I didn't pay her, but I might as well have. Um, because that, that process, that's what I mean by what does even light, a light touch around striving keep in place. Even with a light touch of striving, there's a, there's, it's like we're, we're swimming in the landscape of there's something I need to do. There's something I would like to accomplish. There's, uh, there's a way in which I'm, I'm achieving something, which in particular stages of our practice is very valuable, right? You can imagine that on this retreat with teenagers that I mentioned, um, the Inward Bound um, education, mindfulness education retreat I just finished, you know, teaching teens how to steady the mind is incredibly valuable and that 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 is accomplished in my experience through I'm sure there are many ways to do it but I I've seen great um, benefit from having anchors and focusing on the breath um, focusing on sound focusing on body sensation it's really valuable in terms of the practice of steadying the mind. And in my own experience, there's something um, as the mind knows how to be steady, which I think for most people in this room is, is the case, that you know the experience of being able to steady the mind. It can be, I think, a very rich process to bring inquiry to the nature of what's underneath that process. So specifically, that division that you're talking about. So I'm, I'm just going to use, here's, here's this big, beautiful bell. Um, so you're describing that there's sort of the breath, and even that which is in relationship to the breath can become, it creates a subject-object relationship. So I am aware of the breath, I'm attending to the breath, I'm training my attention, I'm reeling it back in, I'm focusing on the present moment. But can you hear the theme of how each of those sentences begin? What do you, what do you notice about that as I toss that out? Yeah. Yeah, there's, a, there's an I am doing, I, I have a job, I'm accomplishing something. 
even something as subtle, right? So if you're sitting in this room, you know that um, I will be happy when I get a new car probably isn't the way, any, or I imagine we've figured that out by now. So <laughs> if you haven't, keep at it. <laughs> See how it goes and report back, but I haven't had luck with it. I've exhausted that one, you know? I, if I just had a new car or a different job or a different partner, right? We, we see how that kind of subject-object relationship doesn't actually lead anywhere, but it certainly keeps an eye who perceives itself to be lacking in place. And it gives us, again, a job. So I'm interested these days in how, in practice, we can do the same process with very subtle objects. And that can take the form of how many people can relate to getting up from a meditation and saying, oh, that was a good meditation. Or, oh, that was a bad meditation. You know, I was very distracted. But you see, in that, we're, we're taking things so personally. And there's, there's someone with a job in relationship to our practice. So that's what I mean by we don't possess true nature. So from this subject-object relationship perspective, true nature is something that we're going to find. We're going to achieve something that gives us an experience. What shifts when we consider that true nature possesses, if there's a possessing, which there isn't really, but language is difficult, true nature possesses that process. That, that whole process is arising out of true nature. It's known by true nature. It's dissolving back into true nature. It's a different orientation, isn't it? And the reason I titled tonight uh, Being a Buddha is because I'm interested in what changes when we're not fixed on striving to become awake, but we're recognizing, we're remembering inherent awake, awakeness. We're resting into it. We're relaxing into something fundamental and primary then unchanging, undisturbed by the movements of striving, undisturbed by our effort, efforting, Un, unimpressed, delightfully unimpressed by good meditation and delightfully not disappointed by bad meditation. Thank you for sharing that. So what else do you notice as I mention that and in light of your own experience with the meditation, what else are you present to around that? Yes, please. It is interesting, isn't it? I'm so, so glad you were paying attention because what you were saying, again, just in case not everyone can hear, is when you heard the prompt, let go of discipline. And, and you notice I did say, for this meditation, because I know it can be so, for the part of us who's invested in, I need to do this, I need to practice, I need to get somewhere, it's really threatening to suddenly have someone say, you don't have to actually do that right now. So it helps to have the right now on the end of that sentence. Because, yeah, <laughs> it helped to have it be relative. It's like, okay, I'll try it out. Okay, she's a guest. It's only for half an hour. I'll play with it for tonight. Yeah, because I think what you're saying is incredibly important. You're recognizing that according to the conditioned system and the conditioned standards, there's a belief that's revealed in this, and that belief is, I don't have enough discipline. And that belief, I don't have enough discipline, is, is um, exposed as, uh, we, we get to see it in a context like this, as 
one aspect of what keeps that subject-object relationship in place. Because what, what would you have if you had more discipline? The list is long of what you'd have if you had more discipline. Just tell me some of the things. You'd get up early every morning, okay. And if you got up every, early in the morning, what, what would you do? He's just the right person. How did you end up even getting to sit next to him? I mean, <laughs> it's clear. It's clear. It, it is, it's fun to just laugh about, isn't it? Like, what, where did we get the memo that if we X, then we have Y? Now, it's not to say, this is really important here not to become dualistic in this conversation about this. It's not to say there's like no benefit from discipline or, but it's to say that things do shift when our movement towards whatever it is we're going to do arises out of the recognition of the oneness place that Barb was just talking about and the love of something or for something versus that conditioned I would be the right person if. Because how many of us have figured out that approaching, like think about New Year's resolutions. How many people in the room make New Year's resolutions? Not many. You guys have figured out they are a waste of time. Why are they a waste of time? Because we don't keep them and because they're often not always. I do a retreat every year, and this year, this recently I've done an online course too about setting intention from a different place, from a practice place, actually from this kind of, um, we could say non-dual place that I'm referring to. I think it's possible to have intention and, and, and steering, but it's important to distinguish that that's very different than the conditioned standards that set intentions, and then that becomes... Us, it, it feeds the subject-object relationship. So in the most gross plane, um, I, uh, this New Year's, am going to lose 10 pounds, and then I work really hard at it. I see that I'm not doing it. I beat myself up every time I eat jelly beans. I am in a cycle. I'm in a cycle of striving efforting. And I think what's most important that, about that is when, plug in your own version, maybe for you it's not jelly beans, plug in what it is for you, it's maybe not weight, maybe it's I would get up and I would meditate and I would do qigong every day. But what's important about that is what is it that when we're in that conditioned process, what is it that we believe we'd have if we followed through with that so what, what would I, to go back to my gross example, my crude example, what, what would I have if I did lose 10 pounds? What would that give me? Heather? We'd think that we love ourselves more. Yes. I'll, I'll, I'll achieve some some self-worth, I'll, I'll feel better about myself. Yes. Yes, I'll be able to, thank you, Heather. If I can control myself, I can control my environment, I'll get to a place where I feel more worthy. Now, if you've been meditating, I know there are many people in the room that have been meditating a very long time. Can you see how that even can happen on a subtle, we're talking about this crude plane, but can you see how it can even happen on subtle levels with practice? Yes, Sarah, I think I saw your shirt here.
Yes, because there isn't actually a separation, is there? If, I, if other people love me more, then that'll give me more self-worth, and then I'll love me more. Or if I love me more, then maybe finally, you know, they say you can't love another person fully until, you know, that's what they, that's what my Instagram feed says. <laughs> I can't love other people until I love myself, so now I have to work on that. So it's, a, it's, it's deeply in relationship with those things are not, you can't really tease them apart, can you? Yeah. Say more. So, so yes, say more. You, you, Yes, and what I want to focus on this evening is how that's most accessible to us when we're resting in the recognition of who we actually are. So do you know that place where it's like, okay, other people, I'm in, I've, I, I'm like trying to get something from other people. I want other people's love or attention. So my compensation for that is to um, try to just give it to myself. And now I won't need it from other people. But can you feel how then you're just kind of swinging from this, I'm, I'm just kind of affirming like, no, I'm really great actually, over to, no, I want them to think I'm really great. But in, in both cases, what I mean by that you can't tease them apart, in both cases, this I, this sense of a separate self is, is being maintained. And as we rest back into true nature in the way that I'm speaking of this evening, what we're resting back into is the, 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 the surrender. What, what we're doing is we're surrendering into that which isn't busy with the activity of creating separation. The activity of separation could still be happening, but when we're resting into true nature, we're not confused that we are that activity. I don't think, I, I don't think you're with me. Is that an accurate read, or are you with me? Oh, okay, great. I just want to make sure if, if, you, if you're like, actually, that's not my experience, please say it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that is actually terrific because I don't think much comes from us buying ideas. I really don't. I don't think... I have seen plenty of folks who say, well, I buy all the Buddhist ideas, but because they're bought, there's perhaps a lack of exploring them in direct experience. So I think it's fantastic to recognize, well... This, this talk of no self, for example, doesn't, uh, doesn't really, I don't buy that. So then the gift of that from a perspective of practice is, what is my own direct experience? Is it actually my experience that there is this separate self that is... Um, real and fixed and the way that I know the world? Am I, am I this body-mind? Because what we're talking about tonight is, is, I think, at the heart of all practice. We could even say Christian my mystics are exploring a question of who am I and what is that I, from the perspective of a Christian mystic, what is the, that I's relationship with God? 
if we wanted to use that frame. Oh, no, that's fine. That, uh, I, I appreciate your contribution, and that's the place that I think is worth exploring. What is, what is my direct experience? Is it my direct experience that when I align the attention with believing that I am this separate self that needs to strive and achieve and do and be disciplined in order to, is it my, is it my direct experience that that's actually who I am? Is that, is that my most primary and fundamental experience of what I'd call myself? Just a place to explore. Thank you. What else are you present to or noticing with this? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. What what is the true nature? What is it? so she asked what is the true nature if it's not all of the other conditioned processes that we're talking about? What is the true nature if it's not this body mind? What is the true nature if it's not the striving process? What is what is this true nature if it's not the desire to be disciplined and then the beating myself up for the days that I haven't been disciplined. Yes, again, thank you for clarifying. It's so important, I think, for, to, to clarify. It's definitely not that there's anything wrong with discipline. Like I said, you know, having uh, teaching teens how to f direct the attention so that they can place it where they want it to be in any given moment is a really important practice in terms of ending suffering. If you don't know how to take your attention and place it somewhere other than negative self-talk, for example, then you can't have a different experience than the conditioned one that's just laid out for you. And we've seen, especially with teenagers, what happens when the attention is completely aligned with, for example, those kinds of conversations. So, so that process of discipline um, can be extremely beneficial. This, is, this, this evening is not, uh, the theme isn't now just let go of discipline or there's something wrong with discipline. If, 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 there, were, um, if there were a way to describe it differently, I'd say that the theme is to shine light on the, the way discipline is being approached and to be able to bring attention to the... I wanted to do this here because I know there's so many folks that have an established meditation practice. And hopefully, even if you don't, this is still interesting. But I'm interested these days in how we don't allow ourselves to be a Buddha because we're doing a process of maintaining self and other on a subtle spiritual plane. So there's nothing wrong with discipline. In fact, from the perspective of true nature, there's nothing wrong with anything. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with anything that's arising. All that arises, arises out of that same we could also uh, speak about it this evening from the perspective of open, infinite consciousness. So there's nothing wrong. The place that's helpful to see is where does, let's just go with the example of discipline, where does, my, where does the focus of attention on discipline keep this self and other relationship in place? And what's it like as a, as a practice, if you will, 
we're in this room together because we all love practice. So what's it like as a practice to bring attention to how whatever I'm doing, whether it's a process of discipline or process of efforting, a process of doing, process of um, achieving. It's so helpful just to see, is there, to inquire without judgment, is there a different way to be in relationship and if there is, is that actually a relationship? Because in order for there to be relationship, there has to be subject-object, right? For there to be relationship, these two things have to relate to one another. So to me, things get really interesting when instead of just focusing on the discipline or fo focusing on the efforting or focusing on the doing, we turn the attention to what is this process of relating and what shifts when I'm releasing that. And, and, and that, of course, leads to the question of what, what would release it? Is it this that releases it? Is, that, is it that separate self that releases it? How does that it makes some sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, isn't intimacy actually a lack of relationship? Intimacy is the recognition of, of shared being. Intimacy is the recognition of oneness. It's the lack of I'm over here, you're over here. So from the perspective of true nature, all there is is intimacy. There isn't anything else. All there is is that oneness, which requires no effort, no doing, no fixing. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. For, so so what your what your I like this analogy of a Ferris wheel. You're recognizing that the thoughts are are like a Ferris Ferris um Ferris wheel and that in, in your past, one of the things that you've recognized, and I would imagine, correct me if I'm wrong, that through practice, you've been able to see, oh, okay, I'm in one of those little carts, and I'm starting to go upwards, and isn't it wonderful that through practice, we could say, I think I'm going to get off this ride, right? So we're in a magical land where even though you might be very high up off the ground, you can just get off. Maybe, maybe in the land of practice, we can all fly or something. We just get off. And so there's great value to that. And, and so it's a great analogy for this evening because um, there is, there's so much in my own experience benefit that comes from not only getting off the Ferris wheel, but even just seeing, oh, this was the red cart. And the red cart is the angry cart. And when I am in the angry cart, I know because I've been paying attention exactly what happens. I know where it leads. I'm, I have a lot of motivation to get off this cart because my husband benefits when I do, or whatever, right? So, um, so incredibly helpful. And if we stick with that analogy, I think the question could be, 
now, just for the sake of uh, the analogy, um, imagine that this Ferris wheel um, were in this room, in, this, in the open space of this room. And, and notice um, how disturbed is the open space of this room by by the Ferris wheel. It doesn't seem to... It, 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 it might not seem to belong, but I think the, what I'm getting at is... Um, Is the open space disturbed by it? Yeah, the the it's a it's a shift in in orientation. So um, when a sound arises in this open space, is is this open space um, disturbed by it? It's an obvious no. We know, we know with the, something like a sound. But when it's personal conditioning, it, 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 we get hooked. And so the attention goes to that red cart that's rising. And we're in relationship, with, which, as I said, can be incredibly beneficial. And there can be great freedom that comes from a, allowing the, the attention to rest into the open space of the room, if you will, while recognizing that that doesn't mean you're no longer attending to the Ferris wheel. Because the awareness that is open and um, infinite also has the ability to modulate into focused attention that is attending to the whatever car we're in. But the, the lack of striving or the lack of efforting that we're talking about tonight comes from allowing the attention to, to rest in awareness itself. That undisturbable, or from a Zen perspective, we would say unborn mind. The mind that is never born, then mind that never dies. The true nature So it changes the game, if you will, because if we're, if we're in the car on the Ferris wheel, we might be believing, well, if I can do the right thing here, then I'm going to get to Buddhahood. Over. It's going to be over on the other side. It's when I get off, because I will have completed something. It's what? Consider at least the Ferris wheel. Or at least the Ferris wheel <laughs> to get on the other side. Yeah, can you see what's, you know, kept in place with that? Yeah. So it's, I think it's important to recognize that what we're talking about is um, within the context of practice, a somewhat, you know, a, a, not just somewhat, but a, a non-dual perspective within practice. And, and so it's important to recognize that that, again, doesn't mean getting rid of discipline or something's wrong with the process of discipline or getting rid of our ability to discern whether we're in the red car or where we're going or, or how it is to get off it. But it's rather to surrender that whole process to that out of which the process is arising in the first place. Because that's where fulfillment lives. And not lives in a kind of born and dies way, but it's just where fulfillment is. Lasting fulfillment, lasting happiness, not the happiness of, woo, that was a fun ride. Does that relate to your experience? Yeah, thank you. 
All right, it looks like we're at our time. Thank you all so very much. And again, I'm um, delighted to be from Charlottesville, so I do come back regularly. And if you are interested in being on that mailing list, I'd love to keep you posted. Um, do you, are you all familiar with the insight teacher, Martin Alward? He's, uh, he's a European teacher who I'm close with through the Generation X Dharma teachers gatherings. And he and I are probably gonna do an insight retreat in New York together in the spring. So please sign up for that Presence Collective mailing list if that interests you. Oh, thank you. <laughs>